Elijah lived at a time when Israel had reached a low point in her relationship to God. That spineless, vacillating King Ahab had married the wicked Phoenician princess Jezebel. And Jezebel managed to deceive God's people into mixing in the worship of the Lord with the worship of Baal, her God. So we find God's people worshiping the Lord and worshiping Baal at the same time. Elijah did the only thing that a man of God can do in a time like that. He prayed and God gave him a message. So dressed in his camel-haired robe, he went marching into the king's palace, past the guards, down the corridor to the very presence of the king in the throne room and delivers his message. He said to the king Ahab, chapter, 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the land in the next few years except at my word. And just as mysteriously as Elijah had appeared, he disappeared, leaving the king and his men scratching their heads wondering, what was that? Who was he? Anyway, did you notice that funny-looking camel-haired robe he was wearing? That went out years ago. And who does he think he is to seal up the heavens so there'd be no rain except at his word? But there was no rain. The days turned into weeks, the weeks into months, the months into years, three and a half years, there was no rain in the land. The crops failed, the cattle dying, people leaving the country by the droves when finally God sent a message to Elijah and he said, go and present yourself to Ahab and I'll send rain on the land. So Elijah goes, makes an appointment to meet the king Ahab. And I want you to picture this, Ahab riding in his finest chariot with his finest white horses pulling him, trying to maintain his kingly composure and be in control of the situation as he sees Elijah standing there. He goes up to him and he says, you're the one, you troubler of Israel, in verse 16. And Elijah says, immediately taking control, not to be intimidated by anyone, especially a king on this earth because he served the king of kings and lord of lords. And he said, no. He says, no, I'm not the troubler of Israel, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and gone after Baal. Now, in absolute control, Elijah says in verse 19, Now, he said, summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel. Bring the 450 false prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. What could the king do? He had to go along with Elijah. And so he agreed to meet him on Mount Carmel with 950 of the most powerful preachers in the land. 950 false prophets, false teachers, highly respected religious leaders in the land and all the people of Israel and King Ahab himself on Mount Carmel and there was one man of God, Elijah, standing in that funny-looking camel-haired robe. The king, the most popular pastors and preachers and teachers in the land. The most favorite Bible school teachers, parents, fathers, sons, mothers, daughters, all on one side. Elijah on the other side. I think we would stand with Elijah, but it wouldn't be easy. God is always looking for men and women willing to stand alone in the face of the crowd in order to follow the Lamb. So Elijah went before the people in verse 21, and he said, this is the shortest sermon, at least as far as I know in the Bible, but the most powerful. How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, 
then follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. Period. Amen. Sermon over. I know what you're thinking. Preacher, why don't you go like Elijah? <laughs> well, he didn't have a 58 and a half minute television program to fill. <laughs> How long will you waver? If the Lord is God, then follow him. If Baal is God, then follow Baal. But quit claiming to follow the Lord while you're going after Baal. You see, that's the way Satan works. He takes a little bit of error and sprinkles it in with a lot of truth. He's always done that, and he always will. How long are you going to waver? If the Lord is God, follow God. Follow him all the way. Don't sprinkle in a little error. You can't serve both God and Baal. You can't worship both God and the beast at the same time. So then Elijah said, I want you to prepare a test. We're going to test to see who's really God. You build an altar to Baal, and I'm going to build an altar to the Lord. You put an offering on yours, I'll put an offering on mine. You pray to Baal, I'll pray to the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, then he's the real God. And the people said, fair enough, because Baal was supposed to be the God of fire. He was also supposed to be the God of rain, but hadn't been able to do anything about that for the last three and a half years. Let's see what he can do with the fire. So they prepared their altar, they put an offering on it, and they began to pray. Oh, Baal, oh, Baal, hear us. And they prayed and they prayed and they prayed and nothing happened. About noon, the Bible says, verse 27, Elijah began to taunt them. Cry a little louder. Maybe he can't hear you. Louder, louder. Maybe he's taking a nap. Louder. Maybe he stepped out back. He taunted them. And then he said, that's enough. It's obvious. Baal isn't going to answer you. And he repaired the old broken down altar of the Lord, put an offering on it. And about the time of the evening sacrifice, he stepped forward. In verse 36, he prayed, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today, O Lord, that you are God and that I'm your servant and I've done all of these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord, answer me. And then these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and you're turning their hearts back again. And they heard a loud roar, a ball of fire came down from heaven and it burnt the offering. It burnt the altar. It even burnt the water they dumped in the trench around it. And the people fell face down to the ground and they cried out, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is is God and there was a revival Amen. in Israel because one man had the courage to stand against the king and 850 false prophets of the land and all the people one man of God what a man Elijah and then he told them in verse 40 Seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let anyone get away. They seized them. And Elijah had them brought down to the Kishon Valley and slaughtered there. All 850 of them. What we've just seen is an intensely spiritual battle between false worship of a false god and the true worship of a true god ending with a divine intervention in glory and the execution of the false prophets. Does that sound familiar? You've been with us long enough at Revelation now to know that this is pointing us to the 13th chapter of Revelation. And then the Bible says that Elijah prayed seven times and finally the Lord sent rain on the land. It says, meanwhile, verse 45, the sky grew black with clouds, the wind rose, a heavy rain came on, and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came upon Elijah, and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. Elijah was the forerunner to the king all the way into the city. And the Bible tells us that two times again in the future, Elijah is going to be the forerunner to a king. 
This time a greater king, King Jesus. You want to see that prophecy? It's the last prophecy in the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 4. The last word that God had for his people before it was time for Jesus to come. Malachi chapter 4 verse 4. Remember the law of my servant Moses. The decrees and the laws that I gave him at Oreb for all Israel. Verse 5. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. Remember the law of my servant Moses. You see, the return of Elijah presupposes a falling away from the law of God. And Elijah comes back to restore the law of God. Does that sound familiar? You see, these stories are much more than just stories to read to your children at bedtime. They're stories that teach us about the time of the end. So the return of Elijah presupposing, uh, presupposes a falling away to the laws of God and Elijah comes to restore God's law two times in the future. That's what he says, verse 5. See, I send you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. You say, well, I don't see two times there. I only see one time before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. Well, let's ask the best interpreter of the Old Testament prophecies. How many times does Elijah come? Let's ask him. Do you know who that is? Who's the best interpreter of the Old Testament? Jesus. Can you trust him? So let's ask him. Jesus, how many times does Elijah come? In Matthew chapter 17, the disciples asked him that very question. They came up to Jesus, verse 10, and they asked him, why then do the teachers of the law say that Elijah has to come first? You see, the Pharisees were saying Jesus can't be the Messiah because Elijah comes first. They knew about Malachi's prophecy. And Elijah's not here yet, so how can Jesus be the Messiah? So they go running up to Jesus. They're saying you can't be Messiah because Elijah has to come first. What about that? I think they were kind of wondering themselves, don't you? And Jesus answered the question for him. He said, verse 11, to be sure, Elijah comes and he will restore all things. Now tell me, is that past, present, or future? That's future, isn't it? He will come. He will restore all things. That's future. But... I tell you, Elijah has already come. And they didn't recognize him, but they have done to him everything that they wished. In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood. He was talking to them about John the Baptist. And they beheaded him. See, Jesus is showing that there will be a double fulfillment of that Elijah prophecy. Why? Because Jesus comes two times. Once, born as a baby. He came as the Messiah. Second, on the clouds of glory, when he comes again. So Elijah comes two times. He's the forerunner to the king the first time. John the Baptist, forerunner to the king the second time when he comes in the clouds of glory. Well, they went running to John the Baptist. And they said, are you Elijah? And he said, no. Now, wait a minute. Jesus said he was. And John says, no, I'm not. Who's right? They were both right. You say, well, how can that be? In Luke chapter 3, in Luke, the third chapter, verse 3, he, John the Baptist, he went into all the country around the Jordan River preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. 
as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, he was a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. It wasn't necessary for God to bring back the man, Elijah. No, it was the message of Elijah, the voice of Elijah, in the spirit and the power of Elijah to make straight and prepare the way for the Lord to come. You see, they were expecting a reincarnation of Elijah. They were looking for the man, Elijah. And John said, no, I'm not the man, Elijah. I'm the voice of Elijah, the spirit and the power of Elijah. Prepare the way for the Lord. And what did he do? He said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him in verse 7, you brood of vipers, you rattlesnakes, he said, who warns you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance and don't say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you, God can raise up children of Abraham out of these stones. Repent. Produce fruit. Show me by your actions that you want to follow the lamb. Let me see you do it. Don't tell me about it. The only reason they wanted to be baptized was not to burn in hell. And so John was telling them they needed to demonstrate it. And don't claim you're children of Abraham. God can make children of Abraham out of stone. You know, a lot of people tell me, well, pastor, I don't need to be baptized under the water like that. My church doesn't do it. Or I go to this church and they do Sunday, saying Sunday's just fine. And another church says, well, when we die, we go up to heaven or purgatory, and if we put enough in the offering, then we can get them out of there. God can make church members out of stones. You're not going to be saved because you belong to a church. You're going to be saved because you follow Jesus Christ who is the Lamb. doesn't matter if you're Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Seventh-day Adventist. That's not going to save you. What saves you is faith in Jesus Christ and following Him. Even when the whole world is doing something else. And so John the Baptist started preaching. He said, what should we do? He said, the man with two tunics should share with the one who has one. Don't collect more than you're required to. Don't steal. Don't extort money. And Herod, quit sleeping with your brother's wife. Thou shalt not commit adultery. You see, he was restoring the law of Moses. But the prophet said, the prophet said that Elijah would appear again before the great day of the Lord comes. So we should be looking for another Elijah in the last days to remind people of the law of God that he gave to Moses. Now where can we find a message to be delivered in the power of and spirit of Elijah should be somewhere in the book of Revelation if it's the last days before Jesus comes. So where can we find a message that prepares people for the return of Jesus Christ to be delivered just before he comes? Now you should know by now. <laughs> you think it might be the three angels' messages of Revelation chapter 14 and now you're beginning to see why they're so important? No, it's not necessary for God to bring back the man, Elijah, any more than it was for John the Baptist to be the man, Elijah. It's the message of Elijah preparing a people for God to return. And the first angel with the everlasting gospel goes to every tribe, language, nation, and people, chapter 14, verse 6. And he said, with the everlasting gospel, and he said in a loud voice, Fear God, give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Jesus is coming. We are in the end time. We're in the last moments. Now is the time to worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. He's quoting the Sabbath commandment of the Ten Commandments. Remember the law of my servant Moses. That's the Elijah message for the last days. And you're hearing it. I'm not Elijah. No more than John the Baptist was. You're not Elijah. But if you have a part in helping to proclaim the three angels' messages to the world, you are proclaiming the Elijah message. That's why it's so important. 
And then the second angel followed in verse 8, and he said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. Babylon has fallen. On Mount Zion, God's people worship the creator of the heavens and the earth. In Babylon, they're worshiping the beast, the creature, because Babylon has fallen. Now, what does that mean when it says Babylon has fallen? John doesn't explain it. He assumes we understand the fall of Babylon. Well, how are we going to understand that? Remember? The book of Revelation quotes or alludes to the Old Testament how many times? Over 600 times. Here's another one. Let's go back to Daniel. We'll go fast because this is going to be review, at least the first part of it, in the prophecy of Daniel, chapter 1. I want to start at chapter 1. In Daniel 1, verse 1, the Bible tells us, In the third year, the reign of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, that's in Jerusalem, God's people. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came to the city of Jerusalem and he besieged it. So the wicked king from Babylon came to Jerusalem and he captured God's city. Not only that, the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, into his hands along with some of the articles from the temple of God. And these he took to the temple of his God in Babylon and put them in the treasure house of his God. So they went to Jerusalem, captured the city, took the people, took some golden cups, remember that, golden cups out of the temple, brought them back to Babylon and put them in the Babylonian temple and used them to worship the Babylonian gods. So they took something that God had set aside and made holy. Those cups were holy cups. They would be used only to worship the Lord God. They took something that God made holy and they used it in a common ordinary way as though it were not holy. That's Babylon. Now, chapter 5, Nebuchadnezzar had died, and Belshazzar, his son, gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles, and he drank wine with them. And in the middle of that drunken orgy, the Bible tells us in verse 2 that he gave orders to bring those gold and silver cups. So they brought the cups. He filled them with Babylonian wine, those holy cups that would have used only to worship the Lord God. He filled them with Babylonian wine and began to drink to the Babylonian gods when suddenly his knees began to knock, his face turned white, the cup slips from his hand because he saw a man's hand cut off writing a message on the wall. He couldn't understand it, so he called his magicians and astrologers and chart watchers and tarot card players and anybody else he could find. What is it saying? What is it saying? And they couldn't. But somebody remembered Daniel and Daniel came to interpret the message. Listen to what Daniel had to say. Verse 18. O king, the most high God gave your father Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty, greatness, glory, and splendor. And he acknowledged that in verse 21. He acknowledged that the Most High God is sovereign over all the kingdoms of men. Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged God. But you, his son, O Belshazzar, you have not humbled yourself, though you knew all of this. You see, it wasn't as though Belshazzar didn't understand those cups were holy. He knew they were holy cups. He knew he was trampling on something that God made holy when he began to drink to the Babylonian gods. He knew what he was doing. It wasn't ignorance. He knew the truth. And because of that, the Bible says, you knew all of this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you. And you and your nobles, your wives, your concubines, you drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver, gold, bronze, iron, wood, stone that cannot see, hear, or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hands your life. That's why God sent the message on the wall. You set yourself up against God. How did Belshazzar set himself up against God? He took the holy cups... The cups that God said were to be used only to worship Him and trampled on them, treated them like any other cup. And the Bible says He set Himself up against the Lord God of heaven. 
That's why the message came. Well, what did it say? Many, many tackle parsing. Many, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tackle, you've been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. God has numbered the days, brought it to an end. You've been weighed on the scales and found wanting. The hour of God's judgment has come. Babylon has fallen. Here are the three angels' messages right here in the Old Testament. The gospel goes to the whole world. Angel number one, Babylon, Belshazzar, you knew exactly what you were doing. The whole world is going to know the truth before Jesus comes. And those who trample on the things that God says are holy are going to know that's exactly what they're doing before Jesus comes. You see, here's a precursor to the three angels' messages. Now we're ready to understand Babylon in the book of Revelation in the New Testament. Because, you see, in the Old Testament, Israel was a literal nation. And they owned territory and they had political structure. Babylon was also a literal nation, their enemy, up to the north of Israel. And they would come down and fight against Israel. But in the New Testament, the Israel of God is the church of Jesus Christ. Therefore, Babylon in the New Testament is the enemy to the church of Jesus Christ. Today we hear lots of stories in the news and sermons and books and novels about Iraq being Babylon, and that Saddam Hussein was going to rebuild the ancient city of Babylon. He's not going to make it, <laughs> in case you're wondering. But even if he did, it wouldn't be the Babylon that the New Testament is talking about. It wouldn't be the Babylon that Revelation is talking about. Look. Revelation chapter 18, verse 24. In her, Babylon, was found the blood of the prophets and of all the saints and all who have been killed on the earth. Now, if the blood of all who have been killed on the earth is found in Babylon, then Babylon has to be something more than restoring Baghdad or a city near Iraq or a city in Iraq near Baghdad. I'll get it. It has the blood of all who have been killed on the earth. Babylon is the kingdom of Satan. Israel is the kingdom of God. And all who follow the Lamb are Israel. And all who oppose the Lamb are Babylon. Babylon has fallen. What does that mean? Now we're ready for this complex prophecy, Revelation chapter 17. In the 17th chapter, verse 1, one of the seven angels who had seven bowls came and said to me, come and I'll show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. So he sees a prostitute, a harlot, and she's sitting on many waters. Now remember that Revelation is a symbolic prophecy. That's one of our principles we learned from the first verse. The book of Revelation is a symbolic representation of what's going to happen in the future. And so the woman is a symbol. We've learned already that a pure woman who obeys the commandments of God and clings to the gospel of Jesus represents the true people of God. A harlot then would be a counterfeit people of God. If the pure woman, as we learned last night, symbolizes God's church that obeys the commandments of God and clings to the gospel, then the harlot must be a counterfeit church, an enemy to the true church. In fact, when we compare the Old Testament again, comparing Scripture with Scripture, in the little book of Judges, second chapter, Judges chapter 2. 
In verse 17, they, your fathers, would not listen to their judges, but they prostituted themselves to other gods and worshipped them. Unlike their fathers, they quickly turned from the way in which their fathers had walked, the way of obedience to the Lord's command. So when God's people turn away from obeying God's commands, they become spiritual prostitutes. They're harlots. They're not faithful to God anymore. They're faithful to someone else, to Babylon. That's what's pictured here in Revelation 17, 15. The waters you saw where the prostitute sits are people, multitudes, and nations. So this woman is a counterfeit church that is unfaithful to the commandments of God and sitting on many waters, she has the support of practically the whole world. What's her name? Verse 5 tells us this title was written on her forehead, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and the abominations of the earth. Her name is Babylon, a counterfeit church, a fallen church, because she's not faithful to God or His commands. Watch this, verse 3. The angel carried me away in the spirit into a desert, and there I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast covered with blasphemous names, seven heads, ten horns. Sound familiar? We know who that is. So now this woman, symbolizing a church, is found riding a beast. The beast that we discovered was the church of the Dark Ages, the Roman church, from 538 to 1798. So now we see a new church riding and built on the platform of that medieval church that put itself in God's place and tried to change God's set times and laws. And this new church is called Babylon. Watch this now. Verse 4. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet, glittering with precious gold, stones, and pearls, and she had a golden cup in her hand. Just like Belshazzar, who took the holy cup and said it wasn't holy, used it in a common way, this woman takes something that is holy and says it isn't holy and uses it in a common way. Not a cup, but time. God's holy day. Babylon says, we have changed it. It's not the seventh day anymore. Don't burden yourself with such trivia. You've heard it. It's the first day of the week now. You can work on the seventh day. You should work on the seventh day as she tramples something God made holy just as surely as Belshazzar profaned those holy cups. But watch this. This was written on her forehead, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and abomination of the earth. Rome, the Roman harlot, is now seen joined together with her Protestant daughters who join with her in trampling upon God's holy things. So we should see a super church consisting of Rome and Protestants united in declaring that God's holy day is no longer holy. Not only that, the great prostitute who sits on many waters and with her the kings of the earth commit adultery. So once again, like in the past, we should see this church joining hands with the political powers of the state to enforce her doctrines and her decrees and her particular brand of worship. Four things have to happen for this prophecy to be fulfilled. First of all, the Protestant churches will need to merge together. And then the merged Protestant churches will reach across the Gulf and join forces with Rome to form a super church. And then they'll have to reach out and embrace non-Christian religions and bring them into Babylon. And finally, this super church, Rome, non-Christian religions, 
and Protestants who finally reach out to the kings of the world and their political powers relying on them to enforce her particular brand of worship and insist on trampling upon the things that God has said are holy. God wants one church. That's his desire. But never at the cost of compromising the truth. When churches unite despite their differences, that means that their differences are theological differences, biblical differences, understanding of biblical truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the light. So to merge despite their differences is to disregard truth and to shove Jesus Christ out of the way and you don't have a church anymore. You have an army. In March 2000, John Paul II had a plan. I learned about this because I'm on the newsletter. I get an email newsletter from the Vatican called Inside the Vatican. I don't know if they know I'm a Seventh-day Adventist or not, but I get it, and I'm going to show you some stuff that's going to open your eyes round. But here, this is John Paul II's article. As soon as I found out it came out, I got to have one. I ordered it, and here it is right in my hand. Now, this was back before the year 2000, and this was an article that he had prepared in preparation for what he called the Jubilee in the year 2000. He called for a series of meetings between Jews and Muslims and Christians to all meet together at Mount Sinai, Bethlehem, Jerusalem, three different meetings to prepare for this great jubilee where they would all come together in Rome and worship together in one jubilee service. And he said, and it did happen, by the way, and John Paul II says, all are called to be a part of this Catholic unity, the new people of God. Do you understand the vision he had? His vision was to fulfill John's vision of the harlot reaching out to her Protestant daughters and bringing them back into the fold. Now, the author of that paper was Cardinal Ratzinger, who is now Benedict XVI. Cardinal Adam Maeda of Detroit said, this is a very important document. The Holy, the Holy Father wants to find a common denominator in all of our faiths that will allow us to work together. He wants to move rapidly to break down barriers between the churches. He wants temporary agreements to allow members to worship together in the je special jubilee programs. But beyond that, the Pope hopes to move quickly towards full communion, bringing them all in back to the fold. That's his goal. That's his vision. That's his plan. And that's exactly what John saw was going to happen. How do the Islamic leaders feel about this? Imam Muhammad Ali Elijah of Detroit's Islamic Center of America said the whole idea of interfaith communication between religious leaders is an excellent idea. We need to talk about how Islam, Christianity, and Judaism can contribute to society and help with the healing process. In other words, they're saying we're on board. We're with you. We want to work together with you. We want to heal the world. Benedict baptized a Muslim man March 16th 2008, a relatively prominent Muslim leader was baptized into the Roman Catholic Church. Just a symbol of what's going to happen. People always ask me, what about Islam? What about Islam? Islam will be a part of Babylon. In some surprising ways, well, what about Protestant leaders? What do they think of all this? Bishop J. Philip Wall of the Evangelical Lutheran Church said, Personally, I think it's wonderful. In our proposed statement, we would declare that the conditions existing within the church at the time of the Reformation no longer exist. And the central argument between Luther and the Pope, it was just a personal misunderstanding. <laughs> misunderstanding. Well, all were not happy in the Lutheran camp, fortunately. Dr. A.L. Barry, president of the much more conservative Missouri Synod of the Lutheran Church, said, The Catholic Church has not budged since the Council of Trent's insistence on justification by works. The Catholics didn't blink. It was the Lutherans who blinked 
And the Catholics still believe it was saved by works and not by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Well, what progress is being made in the Pope's plan to unite other groups? I couldn't believe this article I saw in the Seattle Times. An unprecedented meeting where two Catholic bishops sat cross-legged on a stage smoking a ceremonial peace pipe with Indian religious leaders. And the purpose of the meeting was to explore ways to bring unity between these two gro groups. Bishop Albert Andrews says there is a rope from heaven and it unravels and each strand is a religion. But that's wrong. There is a rope from heaven, but it doesn't unravel because there's only one strand and the one strand is Jesus Christ. We're not all on the same path to the same place. Many think they are, but they're following the beast that, lo the, the beast that looks like a lamb but speaks like the dragon. There's only one strand, folks. There's only one truth. That's the truth as it is in Jesus. You see, the church has never been afraid to take the pagan traditions and work them into her own system. That's how Sunday worship came about. But that's one tradition they're never going to change. And the other one is the absolute authority of the Pope in determining what's right and wrong. And here comes some of the latest and most startling stuff. Join Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission Report 3. Now this is a little older, but it's going to lead you to something that's just almost unbelievable. Anglican is the English, England's Protestant church, the big church of England, and that Protestant. Within his wider ministry, the Bishop of Rome offers a specific ministry concerning the discernment of truth. Now you got to get this. The Bishop of Rome has a ministry of discerning truth as an expression of his universal primacy. We believe this is a gift to be received by all churches. So all churches should submit to the Pope's determination of what is right and what is wrong and what is truth. This is what the Protestant Anglican Church has agreed to. But thank God there's one world religious leader who refuses to go along with the politically correct trends of the time. John Paulson, president of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, said, we affirm our historical position that spiritual authority is vested in the Bible only as the Word of God and not in an individual. For Seventh-day Adventists, the authority of Scripture and the authority of the Bishop of Rome are incompatible. Thank God someone sees it. But now, in my special email, I just got it a month and a half ago. Inside the Vatican, from Dr. Robert Moynihan, who has audience with the Pope. You're not going to believe what he said in this letter. So you say, well, tell us. Well, I'll tell you. This is amazing. He said, I haven't sent out a news flash for 12 days, but now I hope to report again regularly. Today comes historic news. The Vatican has issued an official text of the document in English translated groups of Anglicans, Protestant Church, which sets up an unprecedented structure to allow Anglican congregations to reunite with Rome but still keep their Anglican traditions. This will be seen as one of the historic documents of Pope Benedict XVI's pontificate. We are watching history unfold here. No, no, no. We are watching prophecy unfold here. But he sees the hugeness of the event. But this is just one part of a larger papal strategy and vision which opens outwardly towards Orthodox churches and what has to do with the mysterious message from Fatima. So he's saying this is just the beginning. The Anglicans, they were close to Rome anyway. Now we're going after the Orthodox, a large body of Russian Orthodox Church that are Protestant. It's just the beginning, he says. It's just opening the door. 
Now, Mary died hundreds of years ago. But she appeared in, in an appar apparition, and now we have this mysterious message. Do you understand what's happening? The church is using messages from someone who has supposedly died to influence her theology and her direction and her movement. Remember Revelation 13? He performed miracles, gathering the world to worship the beast and the kings of the earth, the nations with them. Pope Benedict, who really stymied me for the first little bit, he didn't do much. And I thought, man, you know, if he's going to be the one to wrap this thing up, he needs to get busy. Well, he's busy now. <laughs> In the middle of the economic crisis, or he, he published his paper on dealing with the economy. And I have it. You probably wouldn't want to read it. It's pretty dry. But there are a few things in it that I took out that are not very dry. And here is what it is. He says, in order to manage the global economy, to revive economies hit by the crisis, there is an urgent need of a true world political authority. You got that? In order to manage the economic crisis, it's global now. So now we need a world political authority to manage the economy of the globe. Watch this. The economy needs ethics in order to function correctly. A world political authority that will function ethically. Now look up ethics in your dictionary and the Oxford American Dictionary says a set of moral principles. A set of principles deciding what is right and wrong. So this global authority to manage the economy must be moral. It must have a set of principles that define what is right and what is wrong. But we've already seen, if we ask the question, whose ethics is it? We've already seen that the Pope sees himself as the only one who is the primary discerner of truth. Is this starting to click here? Now watch. It would need to be universally recognized and vested with effective power. So this global authority, economic authority, must have power over all the nations of the earth to enforce its decisions. This is Benedict speaking. He wants to enforce his views on the rest of the world. There is a strongly felt, he says, a need for reform of the United Nations organization and likewise of economic institutions so that the concept of the family of nations can acquire real teeth. Daniel 7, didn't it say something about that fourth beast with teeth of iron? I don't want to make too much of that, but uh, I just thought that was interesting. Could something like this ever happen without the backing of Protestant America? I don't think so. Well, how do Americans, how are we going to be brought on board? You think it was a coincidence that the day after the G8 summit, the Pope had an audience with our president, President Barack Obama, and gave him a white, leather-covered copy of his paper and his plan. Now, I don't know what the president did with it. He might not do anything with it. But one of these days, one of our presidents will. And when I look at how our current administration is bringing our country into alignment with a global monetary system, I think that we're seeing things happen, folks. Keep your eyes open. Speaking of the economy, Pope Benedict has been pressuring Europe to include Sunday legislation in the European Union Constitution. Now, about a year and a half ago, 
it was clear that the Catholic Church wanted Sunday observance enshrined in the law, and that was Benedict's pressure. They even had a, a vote. Seven members of the European Parliament tabled an amendment saying that the minimum rest period shall, in principle, include Sunday. It was tabled. It didn't pass. One of these days it will. But folks, it was brought up for a vote. That ought to get our attention. It was brought up for a vote. Sure, it got tabled, but it was brought up for a vote. But watch the reason behind it. Oh, this one was a huge curveball he threw at me. I thought I had it all figured out. But this one, he caught me by surprise. The amendment stated the likelihood of sickness in companies that require their staffs to work on Sundays is greater than is greater in companies that do not require their staff to work on Sundays. Put that in the economic setting and in our country when we're trying to consider enforced health care legislation and if the president thinks that the Pope is right and that those who work on Sunday will cost much, cost much more health care expense than those who don't work on Sunday, I think even our own president would go for that. Yeah, I'm, I'm speculating a little bit now, I admit that. This is a little speculative. I don't know that's going to happen now, but I know it is going to happen. And it could happen now. Sunday as the traditional weekly rest day contributes to these objectives of family and health more than any other day of the week. Now watch. He went on to say in a sermon, this is a year and a half ago, without Sunday worship we cannot live. Benedict XVI declared, and he said, it is a necessity for all people. The fourth thing that has to happen is that there would be a joining together of church and state to enforce religious particular brand of worship. Have you seen this? I couldn't believe this. This is a document put out by Dr. Napolitani. She's the, the, the director of human, what is it, the Homeland Security Department of the United States of America, shortly after she was installed. This document, it was available on the web. I got it. Good thing I got it fast because it took it off. They took it off. Right-wing extremism, current economic and political climate fueling resurgence in radicalization and recruitment. Now listen to what she says in this paper, how to spot right-wing extremists and potential terrorists within the United States of America. A newly unclassified Department of Homeland Security document warns against the possibility of violence by right-wing extremists concerned about illegal immigration, increased federal power, restrictions on firearms, abortion, loss of U.S. sovereignty, and singles out returning war veterans as particular threats. <laughs> That's why they took it off, because the veterans really started fussing about it. But listen to this. The paper defines right-wing extremism in the U.S. as divided into those groups, movements, and adherents that are primarily hate-oriented based on hatred of particular religions, races, or ethnic groups. And folks, if you haven't figured it out yet, the stuff I've been sharing with you about Rome would be considered hateful by these people. Are you putting this together? Oh, you haven't heard anything yet. <laughs> this report also mentions people motivated by end time prophecies have been linked with radicalization of domestic extremist individuals and groups in the past such as violent Christian identity organizations. Are you interested in end time prophecies? Amen. You're on the list as a potential terrorist. And that isn't all. The last paragraph says, the Department of Homeland Security encourages recipients of this document to report information 
concerning suspicious or criminal activity to the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI. Remember it wasn't that long ago when they were asking us to send any suspicious emails from our friends to the Department of Homeland Security? You remember that? Some of you must. Just a few months ago. Well, they backtracked on that one too, but these ideas are in their head. When we were in Cuba doing a revelation now, we learned that every city block in Havana, every single city block had a president of that block that was to report to the government any suspicious activity. Where are we now? In Cuba? Folks, it's coming. So what does all this have to do? Babylon, merging together of Protestant churches, Catholic churches, non-Christian religions, and the political powers of the, of the state to enforce trampling upon something God has said is holy. And some people are asking, well, what should I do because my church does that? My church doesn't teach that the Lord's day is holy, that the Sabbath is to be kept separate. What should I do? Well, I would never have the courage to tell you what to do. So I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to let God tell you. Because that's exactly what Revelation 18 verse 1 says. I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. This is the Elijah message, folks. And with a mighty voice he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Verse 3, for all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her. Verse 4, and then I heard another voice from heaven say, this is not Jack Cologne, this is God speaking to you. Come out of her, my people, so that you'll not share in her sins, that you'll not receive any of her plagues. Come out of her, my people. Babylon has fallen. Come out of her, my people. But I can't. I've been there forever, and my grandpa started that church, and my pat father is a pastor there. How can I leave? How can I leave all of my friends? Don't leave your friends. Lead them out. Well, I want to go back and change my church, and I'm going to teach all my revelation lessons to the church. Babylon has fallen. You're not going to change Babylon. I've been hearing that for 36 years, and I haven't seen one church change yet, and you won't change the church because Babylon has fallen. Come out of her, my people. <laughs>